Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Georgia Ray, and I am your host. Today, I will be speaking with Derek Brockbank of the Coastal States Organization and Dr. Nicole Elko of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association about sediment placement regulations. Their two organizations, together with the Army Corps of Engineers, recently released a joint report entitled Sediment Placement Regulations of U.S. Coastal States and Territories Towards Regional Sediment Management Implementation. If you want to read the report, you can search for it at coastalstates.org, or it will be included in the show notes. This report comes as there has been increased attention on regional sediment management and beneficial use of dredged material. Later in the episode, we will talk about the relation between sediment and coastal protection and restoration, obstacles to beneficial use, and best practices for policymakers. In the meantime, allow me to introduce my guest. Derek Brockbank is Executive Director of Coastal States Organization, which represents the nation's coastal states, territories, and commonwealths on ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes issues. He previously served as Executive Director for the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, where he led the strategic planning and outreach, government affairs, and development goals of the nation's leading organization advocating for beach and coastal restoration. In the past, he has also been involved as campaign director for a coalition effort to restore the Mississippi River Delta and coastal Louisiana, and has been associated with organizations such as Green Corps, Union of Concerned Scientists, Sierra Student Coalition, and National Wildlife Federation Action Fund. He attended the University of Chicago, getting a degree in political science and environmental studies. Dr. Nicole Elko has 25 years of experience in coastal resource management and is the science director for the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, executive director of the South Carolina Beach Advocates, and president of Elko Coastal Consulting. She is also presently serving on two prestigious federal advisory committees and is one of three civilian members of the Army Corps of Engineers Coastal Engineering Research Board. Before her current roles, she served as the coastal coordinator for Pinellas County, Florida, managing over 35 miles of beaches and waterways and representing one of the largest federal coastal storm damage reduction projects in the nation. She has also co-authored a book on coastal management, numerous technical reports, and over 35 journal publications. Nicole received a BS in environmental resource management with a minor in marine science from Penn State in 1996. She earned her MS and PhD in coastal geology from the University of South Florida in 1999 and 2006, respectively. Nicole and Derek, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. So let's get started with just some organizational definitions. Derek, if you could start us off, what is the Coastal States Organization, or as we'll refer to it today, CSO? Coastal States Organization is an organization that represents the coastal states and territories of the United States. So we've been around for about 52 years. We were formed to represent the interests of the governors of coastal states. And our members are governor appointed delegates. Functionally, that means we represent the each state's coastal zone management program, which is the state agency or the department within a state agency that manages the coast as uh, authorized and identified under the Coastal Zone Management Act. So we are a nonprofit organization, but we represent coastal state agencies in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And Nicole, now turning to you, you work for the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, or ASBPA. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Georgia. So the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association's mission is to preserve, protect, and enhance our coasts by merging science and public policy. We were founded in 1926, and we are also a nonprofit organization. We advocate for healthy and resilient coastal systems. We've been doing this for a very long time, nearly 100 years now. Our membership is made up primarily of the coastal communities around the nation, 
We represent all four coasts. We like to remind folks that the Great Lakes is a coast too. And our organization has a very important technical arm to it. So all of the policies that we advocate for have a strong science basis behind them. I also like to remind people that ASBPA is a boundary organization, which means we help to translate information, of course, scientists to policymakers, but more importantly, from communities and policymakers to scientists. We understand the challenges of the communities, speak with them directly about their needs, and then help federal agencies and researchers use those challenges to frame their research. Great. Thank you both for giving me that background context on who you are and who your organizations are. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we're here today to talk about a joint report that you released entitled Sediment Placement Regulations of U.S. Coastal States and Territories Towards Regional Sediment Management Implementation. So for those listeners who are not super versed in this realm, that title might be a little bit intimidating. And I'd love to start from the beginning. What is dredging and how does it relate to sediment placement? I'll take this one. And a good friend and colleague with a dredging firm always reminds us that on the coast, it all begins with dredging. And in this work, it does. So dredging is basically the art of moving or the science or the technique of moving sediment from where it isn't wanted to where it is wanted in the coastal zone. Um, And so you have massive dredges, which are are boats with some sort of method of sucking up or picking up sand or sediment underneath the water and move it move it to a different place. So it's dredging is used to clear navigation channels, to deepen harbors, to maintain pathways through intercoastal waterways or or to get in and out of ports. And a lot of times that sediment is just dumped offshore because it's the cheapest and easiest way to get rid of that sediment. But increasingly, we are seeing there is a real need for that sediment to put it in the coastal system. So put it on a beach, put it in a marsh. And historically, beaches have been renourished using dredges for over 100 years now. It started in Coney Island in the 20s, where they realized beaches were eroding. And so they used a dredge to take to pick up sand and put it on the beat. And so dredging is really just a way of, of moving sand and, and sediment around. And so it becomes very important in the coastal zone. So something that we are going to be talking about today is what the beneficial uses of dredge material are, which to me, it seems are maybe the things you just alluded to, using it on a beach, using it to bolster our shorelines. What's the difference between these beneficial uses of dredge material and regional sediment management? Regional sediment management is a concept that allows for the use of sediment as a resource, right? Like you were just mentioning. For example, we're really, ASVPA is really trying to push education on this piece right now. Our theme for 2023 is sediment as a resource for coastal resilience, So we want to remind people that sediment from dredging, for example, is not a material or a waste, right, to be disposed of, but rather a resource that can be used to bolster shorelines, to increase elevations as sea level rise. And regional sediment management goes a lot farther than that, right? It gets into the science of sediment movement, sediment budgets. It thinks about sand that's on the coast, that's in the estuaries, that's out in the ocean, and and the interactions between all that. So it's a a very broad theoretical kind of concept that's used for planning and management, whereas the beneficial use of dredge material is more of an operational concept, an action that is taken when sediment is dredged from a navigation channel, for example, and then placed in some manner that is useful, right? It's not disposed of, rather it is placed beneficially in some of the ways that Derek just described. If I can jump in on that, George, I think it's also important context to understand that we are really in a sediment crisis and more acutely a a sand crisis in the world, probably second only to clean drinking water. We are running out of easily accessible sand and sediment supplies. So whether you're using that sand for construction, you know, for concrete or glass, which is the biggest usage. Or if you're on a coast, as you as you are seeing seas rise and water slowly encroaching into the, the coastal area, there's an increasing need for sand. And we've been using sand for centuries. Go back to the pyramids that we've been using sand for millennium. 
and easily accessible sand that can be used for construction, that can be used for coastal restoration is getting harder and harder to get. And so that sort of drives this need for regional sediment management that we can't just sort of think of sand as a byproduct or a waste product, or as sometimes has historically been termed in the coastal area, a spoil, right? It's a dredge spoils. As Nicole said, sediment management is sort of a concept, a way of doing things. And the beneficial use of dredge material is a is one sort of tool or technique that can advance the concept of regional sediment management. That definitely makes sense. You have kind of the overarching plan and strategy of the regional sediment management, and then the beneficial uses of dredge material are one part of that. And it's helpful too what you just said, Derek, to situate us within this episode, which is this is a resource that is becoming increasingly precious and maybe part of the reason why there has been some recent movement in this space. In preparation for this episode, you all were nice enough to share with me one example of such a regulation, the Water Resources Development Act of 2020, Section 125. So can you explain a little bit more about this act and what it does and why it's so important? Section 125 of WERDA 2020, so the Water Resources Development Act, many of your listeners probably know. It's a legislation that that usually happens every two years. It covers Army Corps of Engineers policy. It authorizes projects for the Army Corps of Engineers. It deals with all sorts of national water infrastructure issues. And so it is a bill that comes out every two years. In 2020, there was a pretty significant section that addressed the beneficial use of dredge material. So the start of Section 125 said that it is the policy of the United States and the policy of the Army Corps to, where environmentally feasible, do or attempt to do beneficial use of dredge material. So it sort of said it's the policy of the United States that we shouldn't just be wasting sediment. We should be trying to beneficially use that. So that's sort of the the high overarching principle of the section. And then it it went in and it explained a couple different ways to do that. And, And this builds on, you know, decades and and certainly other water resources development acts have discussed aspects of beneficial use, but this was the first one that really laid it out there as a national policy. And it, it did, it sort of set out how to do this policy in a couple of ways. The first was to address and slightly change the way the federal standard is interpreted. The federal standard is the way the Corps determines whether or not it can use dredge material, material that's been dredged beneficially. And it basically says the core needs to dispose of that dredge material in the cheapest way possible, so long as it's not doing any environmental damage. So if it's cheaper to just take that dredge material and dump it, you know, way offshore in 5,000 feet of water where you'll never see that sand again, and that's what they have to do. This looks at the federal standard, doesn't totally get rid of it, but says you need to sort of consider the full life cycle cost of that sand. Meaning if you are going to then later need that sa- need sand in that same location, then maybe getting rid of it now and having to come back and dredge it up later is not the best way of doing it. So it reconfigured the federal standard. The second thing it did is it gave the secretary of the Army for Civil Works, so the head of the Army Corps of Engineers, the opportunity, it said legal parlance may, not shall, but the secretary may use beneficial use of dredge material, even if it doesn't meet the cost standard. And that's because there are times when, you know, there are environmental benefits that are just hard to quantify. And then the third one that I think is also really important is it requires every single Army Corps district in the country to set up five-year dredge material management plans. So the Army Corps determines what it does by the budget it's given by Congress. And so they can't sort of say, this is where we absolutely 100% will be dredging in the next five years. But it can put out a plan that says over the next five years, this is where we anticipate dredging. These are the projects, the coastal restoration projects that we anticipate doing. And so it it, it sort of provides some transparency and some daylight into what the Corps is looking to do over the next couple of years, which in turn allows local stakeholders to provide input into what projects should be done and also start to identify if there's going to be a local cost share or, or, or local funding that they need to do to prepare for some of this. They can have some of those out year plans. So one of the other goals, or maybe this is a goal set kind of alongside that regulation, you can tell me, but set by the core is to increase beneficial use of dredged material to 70% by 2030. This is something you all mention in the recommendation section of your joint paper a couple of times. So obviously something that is very important. What needs to happen to make this goal a reality? So the Army Corps of Engineers prioritized regional sediment management several decades ago now, and beneficial use of dredge material has been a focus of the Army Corps of Engineers 
The amount of sediment that has been reused beneficially in recent years ranges from maybe 30 to 40 percent, which is actually a lot better than than has been happening in the past. So how do we get to 70 percent? Well, the first step is the goal itself, right? The chief has motivated the Army Corps of Engineers to, to do better. And other agencies and other dredging entities, you know, communities, private groups like port authorities are taking note. And it's really having a, a big impact, I would say, on the, you know, the, the dredging and coastal management community. So getting it out there, saying it out loud, I think is our first step. And then as you alluded to, there are many ways that we can go about this. Lots of them we know and we can, you know, talk about they're they're not easy, but others we haven't figured out yet. And it involves innovation, right? And so the future is pretty exciting for this area. In the short term, the low-hanging fruit things to do are collaborate, think differently, change. Federal entities that have been doing same things the same way for 100 years, um, you know, asking them to not put put that sediment offshore in an offshore disposal area and rather think differently, work with the local community, find ways to use that sediment in a new way. That's hard. These are things that we're really working with the core now on. And then over time, we're really excited about the innovations that will come with increased funding opportunities, better implementation guidance, as Zerk was mentioning, and then, of course, the collaborations with communities and other agencies to modify policies and regulations to allow sediment placement that may have not been possible in the past. Now that we've really dived into the weeds a little bit on the policy side, I feel like something we've been dancing around a little bit is the importance of this kind of work right now. And there's this implicit connection with coastlines when we speak about sediment and as we've spoken about it today, but I want to make that explicit. How do these efforts connect with the receding coastlines associated with climate change? Pretty clear that our coastlines are eroding and receding as sea levels rise. You aren't just seeing the seas rise up, but that's creating an impact on our coast. You can read articles about the impact of cliff erosion in California. You can read see pictures of barrier islands either washing away or rolling back, you know, houses being undermined, houses that used to be built at the back of a, a beach are now all of a sudden getting, you know, having their foundations taken out from under them as seas rise and encroach upon the shores. And so increasingly we are going to be looking at the need to move where we have our developments, but moving is phenomenally expensive as well as very politically challenging and and just really hard to plan. And so in many cases, it makes a lot more sense to continue to restore the shoreline to where it is for the time being. So there's increasing pressure to restore our shorelines and that that pressure will need to be balanced. We'll need to balance restoring and retreating, but restoring will take lots and lots of sediment resources. And so we really can't waste it. We're also seeing more natural areas that if we want to keep them as such, they are going to need some help. So you think of wetlands. Wetlands do have some ability to keep pace with sea level rise. You know, as as the vegetation dies out, it becomes new sediment and can keep pace. But in some places, we're seeing seas rise faster than wetlands can keep pace. And so the ability for people to sort of help that means placing sediment on that wetland. That's sort of what I was thinking about, and that is not only utilizing sediment to restore natural communities. We have a terrible decline in shorebird populations, for example, due to the fact that many of our coastal systems are eroding, but also using those natural features to protect the community. So kind of putting the two things that Derek was talking about together. There's a popular phrase nowadays, it's called living shorelines. And living shorelines are, it's a reference to rather than building gray infrastructure like a wall or some type of a protection, engineered protection device with concrete, you build something out there that is similar to what nature had out there before erosion and sea level rise took place. A wetland that is protecting a coastline, a beach at ASBPA, we like to say that beach nourishment was the original living shoreline. Really what we're talking about is green infrastructure or natural and nature-based features, and sediment is the foundation of all of those products. 
And Georgia, if, if you don't mind me co-opting, I can sort of use this to pivot a little bit into what we were talking about in our report, which are the need for some changes. And I think one of the interesting things is that historically, many of the regulations and policies around how we use our coast we're actually finding challenging in an era of sea level rise, right? There was sort of a, a regulation system that sort of set in place what was allowed. And so things like seawalls and hard infrastructure and riprap, there's very clear delineation for how to do that. But for things like living shorelines, it's a little harder to permit, right? Because not everything is going to look the same. You know, you build a concrete wall or you put rocks in front of your house and it looks pretty much the same whether you're in Maine or Florida. But living shorelines won't because they're taking advantage of local ecosystems to uh, adapt to find what the best resilient solution is. So you need to make changes like that. And that gets into some of the regional sediment management policies. One thing that I've found is interesting is some of the environmental laws passed in the 70s that were trying to stop people from filling wetlands, right? You know, if you're a, you know, you're a clean water expert, you know, we don't want to fill wetlands. We need to protect our wetlands. Well, those regulations are currently in some cases, preventative for allowing us to what we call sort of nourish wetlands, allow wetlands to keep pace with sea level rise. We aren't trying to fill those wetlands. We are trying to help them adapt to sea level rise. But what that means is putting dirt and sediment on them. And so there are restrictions to that. And so I think one of the things we need to think about and as we're doing regional sediment management, one of the recommendations from our report is to look at regulations that have been set in place to prevent putting sediment or putting dirt into the coastal zone, usually in a wetland environment, that were intended for good purposes, but now are actually preventing us from doing some of the restoration and some of the adaptation work that needs to happen. I don't mind you co-opting at all. And I think that was a really great clarification that you made, especially the part about how this does look different from locality to locality. And it reminds me of the case studies that you had in your report. You all highlighted 14 case studies that had successful approaches from states, territories, and federal partners taken to increase the beneficial use of dredged material. So I would love to hear you take us through one of them, but also pose the question to you, kind of what you were just speaking about. If these are maybe more case by case, how can people who are reading your report use what these specific areas did and apply them to their context, even if it's not exactly the same? Well, I can talk about one of them building off of Derek's statement about the need for some changing some regulations surrounding marsh restoration. There are a lot of rules in place, and this also gets at my area of expertise, which is the technical side of things. And in addition to dredge and fill laws, which is what Derek was referring to, prohibiting the placement of sediment in wetlands, for example, we also have laws about the quality of sediment when we weren't in a shortage, you could be really picky about the sand you put on your beach. And you could say, I want 95% of the sediment that gets on this beach to be perfect, beautiful, white sand of, of the exact grain size. And a lot of states now have laws that actually mandate that. That makes beneficial use of dredge material hard, right? So it's, it's some of these regulations that we're pushing up against as we try to do the right thing and, and reuse sediment. So the state of North Carolina, and this is one of the case studies we highlight, has recognized the fact that they don't have a process in place to permit wetlands using a method called thin layer placement, where rather than just kind of pumping a slurry of sand and water into an area that could possibly erode the area, right, by the construction process itself, perhaps you're going to spray some sediment on a marsh and just bring it up a couple of inches, okay? Think of this product being the thin layer of sediment on top of the marsh. Well, again, we our laws don't let us put dirt on marshes, and there is no permit you can go apply for to get a thin layer placement project done in North Carolina and many other coastal states. So one of the things that we're really proud that North Carolina has done is they have gotten all of the possible state and federal entities together. This is an example of interagency collaboration toward better permitting and planning. And they said, if we were to do one of these, if you had a, a regulation, a policy, a, a procedure that allowed you to permit a project like this, what would you need? What type of requirements would you request from the agency, from their engineering firm? So they have put together this guidance that does allow partners to now propose and permit thin layer placement projects with this lovely proactive example of interagency collaboration. That's a great example of what one state is doing. And 
it's going to be a little bit different in every state, right? Every state has their own local regulations, their own coastal management plans, their own you know priorities, whether they're dealing with lobster aquaculture or mangroves, right? Very different. But all of them are going to have similar kind of challenges to that regulation. So we hope that that case study can, can inspire or inform other states who are thinking about how to set up collaborative processes. Listening to you explain this changing regulatory system, the relationship between sediment and existing water bodies, wetlands, it does remind me of the decision in Sackett versus EPA that just came out yesterday as we currently record here in late May 2023, a few weeks ago by the time this episode will be released. And largely that Supreme Court decision was seen as a loss for the environmental community for I'm sure most of our listeners know the de- the general details of the case, but in case you don't, essentially there was a couple who wanted to build on a property and on their property were wetlands. And they began to fill in those wetlands with material, with sediment, in order to allow them to build on it. And they were told by the EPA that they had to stop that because these wetlands were protected. Now, this couple was not on a coast, so definitely different than what we're talking about today, those instances when maybe wetlands do need to be filled in. But ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the couple saying that they could fill in the wetlands on their land. And it gets into, you know, I won't get into the too many of the details today. It really doesn't concern sediment explicitly as much as it does the definition of what is a water of the United States. But as you guys hear this decision, as I mentioned, it's generally seen as a loss from the environmental community. But is there some element of it that might make it easier on our coastlines to reuse sediment in beneficial ways. I don't I don't think it does. I think the only <laughs> the only silver lining that I could see is I think it points out that as important and seminal as the Clean Water Act was, it was probably a little bit vague and probably a little bit too vague. And so how the EPA interprets it is constantly subject to litigation. And so I think what would be better is to relook at aspects of the Clean Water Act and and clarify it and sort of take a look at some of those you know 1970s era laws that were absolutely transformational, such as the Clean Water Act. From my organization's perspective, the Coastal Zone Management Act, you know, absolutely critical laws. They're probably in a little bit of a need of a refresh, and I think you could do some really good work. And I think some of the recommendations that we have could come from reviewing some of those pieces of legislation. However, looking at the congressional and legislative climate that we are in, I I don't really foresee an opportunity to do that in sort of a comprehensive and thoughtful and climate forward kind of way. So interesting perspective, right? We are talking about filling in wetlands in Sackett, and we're talking about how do you allow for filling or, or adding material to wetlands to help it adapt to climate change. So I think in sort of a perfect policy world, you could see some benefit from that, but just the, the realities of, of our congressional makeup right now, I, <laughs> I struggle to see a silver lining. Yes, it seems like that's the tone most people are striking in response to this decision. But your report does identify 50 plus recommendations. What are the most important? If you had the ear of Congress, what would you really want to get through? I will say a couple that I think are are important and actually a couple that I think are underway, which I'm really excited about. So one of our recommendations that we've had for a while is the implementation of the five-year dredge material management plans that I talked about earlier. Uh, And so Ensuring that that actually happens, I think, was a good one. I think allowing districts to really plan out and not in sort of a 20, 50 year grandiose plan that isn't really implementable, but five year plans, I think, is really helpful. And and that is beginning to happen. It, you know, it just passed in, in 2020. And so it's really just starting to happen at the district level now. Another one is updating from a really policy perspective is updating the principles, requirements and guidelines and having that implemented by the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is a way of analyzing what water projects should be moving forward. Uh, and it's looking and the, the principal requires requirements and guidelines that were put in place under the Obama administration that are now going to be implemented at the core. Talk about the need to think about comprehensive multi-benefit projects. So it's not you're not trying to maximize just flood risk protection or just ecosystem restoration or just coastal navigation. 
you really are looking at how those projects intersect. So I think those are a couple sort of key ones that are happening. I think that the sort of maybe the harder ones are the ones that happen to ha- have to happen locally because they have to happen in multiple jurisdictions. And that gets to the collaboration that we talked about coming coming from the North Carolina thin layer placement guidance so that the work that's happening in North Carolina to bring that together is absolutely critical. But that's not something that you know Congress can do. That's something that needs to happen locally or regionally. And so that's a real challenge. And then I think some of the issues of looking at state regulations and federal regulations and ensuring that those processes can happen concurrently in parallel. And so you're not sort of seeing, first, you have to get this permit, then you have to get this permit, then you have to get this permit, because those can end up taking a, a huge amount of time. And one of the challenges with beneficial use of dredge material is the projects need to happen when the dredge material is available. This is not like you're, you're not planning a restoration project and just going to do it when it works. The concept here is you're taking advantage of material that is being dredged to put it in a a beneficial place. So those would be a couple from me. Nicole, interested in your thoughts on some of the more technical ones that we provided. Okay, thanks, Derek. I agree and think some of those permitting recommendations in particular are extremely important. And the one that I'd like to focus on gets at the goal that we started off this conversation talking about from the Army Corps of placing 70% of the sediment beneficially by 2030. The regulations that are in place right now, and I alluded to them when I mentioned the perfect sand on the beach, are often taking sediment away from us, right? It's it's taking areas that we could potentially dredge and reuse beneficially and, and making them off limits. So if we can do some of this work of changing the way that we've done business, of reconsidering regulations and policies about the way we characterize sediment and how we understand and define compatibility, right? This is compatible with the beach. This sediment is compatible with a wetland. We can really increase the volume of sediment available for coastal resilience projects. So I think that's a really important one is this technical aspect of understanding the sand better, not only how it exists in the world before it's dredged, what the regulations are to place it, but also what happens between the time that is dredged from the ocean floor and placed into that wetland or beach. The dredging process itself, that operation of dredging involves kind of stirring up the sand with a lot of water and sending it through pipelines in a hydraulic slurry. And what that does is it rinses the sand, right? It's like rinsing um, something in your colander in the kitchen to get any kind of debris out. So the sediment actually ends up cleaner when it comes out of the end of the pipeline of the dredging process. We don't understand that. Research is needed to better understand the process of dredging and how we can then take that science and apply it to some policies to increase sediment and beneficial use nationwide. Thank you, both of you, for explaining a few more of those recommendations in detail. I think that's really a helpful note to end on. And thank you for joining me in general today. Well, thank you, Georgia. I I did want to give two more quick plugs or shout outs. This report and the work that Nicole and I did with ASBPA and CSO would not have been possible without the the funding and the partnership of the Army Corps of Engineers Institute for Water Resources. Obviously, a lot of the the work that we're talking about is, is being done by Army Corps. And the Institute for Water Resources is sort of like a little department within the Army Corps that's sort of like the think tank of the Army Corps. It can come up with policy ideas and and they were well aware that we needed to look at how we do beneficial use dredge material. So they were active partners in helping draft the report and also helped fund it. So really wanted to thank them. And then, George, I wanted to just sort of thank you. Appreciate you guys at Environmental Law Institute reaching out to CSO and ASBPA to have a podcast. And I'm really excited that I also host a policy podcast. And I'm very excited that hopefully in the next month or two, I will be able to have someone from Environmental Law Institute on to talk about some yet to be determined topics, but I think I've got an idea. So really glad we can sort of pass off on a podcast. So if you're if you're interested, uh, check out American Shoreline Podcast Network. Again, American Shoreline Podcast Network, anywhere you get your podcast, and you'll be able to hear a little bit more about coastal issues and, and an upcoming podcast with ELI. Yes, thank you for plugging that episode that will soon be coming out. I know we are excited about it here as well. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at eli.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, 
or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.